laptop if I record things. For all of our work on stress concentration, we'll be talking about stresses and polar coordinates. So now, uh, relative to a body, uh, we'll be looking at some coordinate, uh, some distance r and theta away, and we'll be looking for the stress at that point in terms of the radial stress, the hoop stress, and the shear stress on that element. So we have the radial stress sigma rr, hoop stress sigma theta theta, and still just shear stress sigma r theta. And I gave uh, transformation equations from Cartesian to polar last, uh, cylindrical polar last week. Uh, there's also spherical polar, but we won't have to worry about that. Uh, so now the question is, I, uh, how, so if I have a circular hole in a semi-infinite plate, so I'm gonna draw a wiggly surface here on the outside uh, to mean that this thing goes off in much, uh, much bigger than the actual thing that I'm drawing. I'm just kind of zooming in on the hole here. Um, so say this would be like if I had a, a hole punch inside a sheet of paper like this. So a very, a very small hole relative to the total body. So I'm assuming semi-infinite plate. If I have some far field stress now uh, on both directions, I'm going to call this sigma naught. I, I think I was using sigma infinity last time and that might have been a little bit confusing. So I'm going to call this sigma naught is my far field stress and I want to know what the stress concentration around the hole is. So uh, we had already, so last week we said that the maximum stress was probably here at the top and bottom of the hole. The minimum stress was probably here at the edges and then the, the question is how much. So to actually solve this problem, this is one of those problems you can solve analytically. Uh, we can set up boundary conditions for this. So we say in the far field, so at, so now um, I'm going to define all my coordinates from the center of the circle uh, in terms of r and theta relative to that hole. So at um, r is very large, as r goes to infinity, I have the that I just have a uniaxial stress, so I have my sigma x is sigma naught, or in terms of my polar coordinates, sigma r is one half sigma naught, uh, one plus cosine of two theta, sigma theta is one half sigma one minus cosine of two theta, and sigma r theta is negative one half sigma uh, sine of two theta. So this is at some distance far away. Uh, and this is just saying that I have um, a uniaxial stress, but in polar coordinates. The other boundary condition I have is at r is equal to a. So at, at the edge of this hole, now I'm gonna say this hole is some diameter or some radius a. So at my radius A, so at the edge of the circle, uh, because there's a free boundary condition here, I can't have anything pulling or pushing in this direction. So my sigma R is equal to zero there, and my sigma R theta is equal to zero. But because I have a continuous circle here, I can still be pushing and pulling along the direction of the, the circle. So I have some sigma theta theta um, and that's going to be, so if, if I'm assuming my maximum stress is going to be along that edge, then now I want to know, I, I'm going to say that this is the only stress that I have along that edge, and this is what I need to figure out. So you can solve this out using something called the Airy stress function, which uh, I'm not actually going to go through in the analysis, but I want you to know about it if you ever take a, a more complex uh, solid mechanics class. Airy stress function, uh, which is some function that I'm going to call phi that relates to all of my derivatives of stress. So um, ah, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to write it out. But uh, basically, the, the second derivative of this function with respect to different coordinates would 
match up to these. And so I can relate all of my stresses to a single function, fi figure out what this function is. It's, a, it's an ordinary differential equation that I then have to solve, or sorry, partial differential equation because it's in terms of r and theta. And then I come up with some answer, plug in these boundary conditions, and eventually what I would end up with is a general solution to these. So um, the whole big general solution, the full field solution, uh, I plugged all of that stuff in, is I would get my radial stress far away from, uh, everywhere in the surface is sigma naught over two, and this is gonna be kind of a big thing. Uh, one minus a squared over r squared plus one plus three a to the fourth over r to the fourth minus four a squared over r squared cosine of two theta uh, sigma r uh, or sigma theta theta is still a sigma naught over two uh, one plus a squared over r squared minus uh, one plus three a to the fourth over r to the fourth cosine of two theta and then there's a there's an r theta but that term doesn't matter as much so I'm not actually going to write it out. Um, but so the important term here is actually this, this theta theta term that we got. And what we want to know specifically is what this theta theta is at, sigma theta theta is at the edge of the circle. So if I were to plug in now um, my sigma theta theta, my hoop stress at r is equal to a, then I could say this is equal to sigma naught over 2 this is one plus one. Uh, this is one plus three, so four cosine of two theta, or just sigma times one minus two cosine of two theta. So this now is our big important result. And this is the hoop stress along the edge of the circle. So you can see that this is now varying sinusoidally around the edge of the circle. If I were to plug in my stress now, sigma theta theta at r is equal to a and theta is equal to zero, that is that corresponds to the, the point along the direction of the stress, so that edge of the circle there. Um, at my theta theta, then I have one minus two, and I actually get a negative sigma naught. So I actually have a compressive stress along that edge. Uh, and along the top edge, if I then say sigma theta theta at r is equal to a and theta is equal to pi over two, or 90 degrees, then this, I have cosine is negative one, um, or cosine of, of two pi, or cosine of pi is negative one, so I have one plus two, which is then three sigma naught. So if I were to draw what this looks like now, I have a, a general function of my stress along the, the edge of that hole. Uh, let's make sure all of these are in frame. Uh, now I have a, a large plate there. Some stress being applied. Sigma naught. What this looks like is along the edge of that hole now, I have a compressive stress along these two edges, and I have a tensile stress along these top edges. So this top point of the circle is three sigma naught, three sigma naught, and this side edge is, is negative sigma naught, or uh, I keep doing, ignore the, the negative and the sign, just know that it's a compressive, a, a, a negative and the arrow pointing in the opposite direction. Um, but so basically the hole is trying to be pulled apart here on the top edge, and it's actually trying to be compressed here on the side edge. So this is now what the, what the stress in this body looks like. If I were to plot it 
Uh, there's a. I'm going to try this, and I didn't actually practice it at all, so it's probably going to fail miserably. Um, if I were to try to plot the magnitude of the stress now in a polar plot, which is going to not look great. So I'm going to say along this line, my sigma is zero. Along this line, my sigma is three um, sigma naught. And along that line, it's negative sigma naught. What I have is something that looks like this, that, that that and I have some shape that looks something like this it's a peanut yeah so we get this peanut E shape and along here I have from the edge of the circle this is stress this is still compressive stress this is now tensile stress going out in these directions that didn't turn out as bad as I expected. Cool. So we have a ma maximum tension there, maximum compression there. How would the analysis change if instead of a hole you had a different material uh, that was in there, like uh, a or something? Oh, that's a good question and a lot more complicated than analysis. And I. So then, ooh. so the, there's something called uh, an Eshelby stress tensor, which uh, is this theory that a guy named Eshelby came up with in like the early 1900s, uh, basically describing that problem. If you have an elliptical inclusion inside of a, a body, and you stress out that body, you can. I'll I'll talk to you about it later if you're okay. if you're interested. <laughs> There's an interesting analytic solution to the problem. Um, yeah, but it's a it's a much trickier one to look at. Okay, so the other question then is now if if my stress is three three times my my critical stress. Oh, first uh, here I'm I'm going to define now uh, a stress concentration factor. Concentration factor, and I'm going to call this KT is the maximum stress over the far field applied stress, which now for my, my circular hole, circular hole in tension, kT is equal to three. So now this, this effectively means like pro problems that this is relevant for um, if you have uh, say a, a rivet hole in an airplane wing skin or a hole in a window on a on a plane where you have this sort of, of pressure or tension acting in uh, acting in multiple directions that stress around that inclusion is going to be for a, for a perfectly circular hole is going to be three times higher than just the the normal stress in the body and so if you add so so for airplane wings you have a thin aluminum sheet covering the, the surface of the wing that then has holes punched into it with rivets to connect everything. And those are, the skin is in tension. Um, and so those holes will have a much higher stress concentration around them than in the rest of the body. And this is something, again, this is one of those engineering solutions that came up out of necessity. Because once we started making thin sheets of things and putting them in tension, we noticed they started breaking. So if you remember in the very beginning, I had the, the airplane, um, the airplane, the comet, the Havilland comet that got split in half because there was a crack that initiated at the corner of a square window in a plane. And that's why all of our planes now have round windows because square windows have much higher stress concentration factors. Um, cool. So the question, the next question is how fast this stress decays going away from uh, this interface. So if I wanted to look at the stress going along either of these directions, it's three sigma or negative sigma at that interface. 
but then how quick does it drop off? Does it stay three? Does it is its volume a lot larger? Is it, does it stay small? And so we can use that same analytic formula we had for our, our stresses here uh, and say the stress now, say at, at sigma is equal to, or at theta is equal to zero, uh, and at theta is equal to uh, pi over two or 90 degrees. Theta at, this is pi over two. Uh, and we can write those out if we plug in now our cosine of two theta is zero. We can plug things in and rework this equation um, and say this is sigma naught over two uh, a squared over r squared minus three a to the fourth over r to the fourth. So it's a quadratic and this is also a quadratic sigma naught um, one plus a squared over two r squared plus three a to the fourth over r to the fourth. Um, so because it's somewhat hard to, sometimes hard to just visualize what those stresses are, uh, I can draw now for this circle uh, with that far field stress applied. Uh, I know the stress here uh, is a negative sigma naught at that interface and it kind of decays pretty quickly going away based on that r to the fourth um, eventually tailing off to to zero at, in the far field because there's no this is now for a hole with a far field applied stress like this so I'm not actually applying a stress in this direction but I still get a stress in that direction and so that and that stress is compressive so eventually far away it returns to zero um, and then along the vertical direction I'm eventually uh, going to return back to, uh, let's draw this as a dash line, um, I'm eventually going to return back to in the far field some sigma naught far away and then some three sigma naught close to it and it kind of decays back to that relatively quickly. So this is now with a far field applied stress. Um, to figure out exactly how fast that decay, I can plug in a couple r values and say uh, for my sigma theta theta at theta is pi over 2 um, and my r is equal to a, then I have 3 sigma naught if my r is equal to 2a, so this is now twice the radius of the circle away. Uh, I drop down pretty quickly to 1.45, 1.45 sigma naught at 3a and at 4a. Uh, I'm at 1.11 and 1.07. So I, I drop off relatively quickly. So even though it's it's a fairly high stress concentration near that circle, it, it drops off. Um, based on the, that r to the fourth. If we now want to look at the full field thing, so I have this equation that I will give to you all for the stress concentration lab, which might pop over. Cool. So. Um, this function now is a function of the stresses around that body. So we can, so uh, this is, it's slightly different because now I'm plotting uh, sigma xx and sigma yy instead of the radial and polar stresses. So I'm not showing you that same uh, polar stress plot that I showed before, just because it's a lot, eh, I guess it wouldn't be that much harder. but because I started plotting this as a contour plot. So um, you can see here, there's some stress at that. Uh, this is for a, a, a thing in tension now with the tensile axis going up, up and down. 
um, so it's being stressed vertically. Uh, you can see that uh, three times the stress here, and then uh, negative one times the stress here. So this is now, if I'm pulling it in the vertical direction, I'm getting a negative stress at that edge, a positive stress at this edge. Um, and this is what the stress looks like in Cartesian coordinates, which uh, I just use my, my Cartesian to polar transform to switch back and forth between. So um, for, did that even come out? The colors there are awful. Um, so for the DIC lab, we'll be giving you this code in Python and in MATLAB. Uh, so you'll be able to look, so what you'll be getting from your, from your DIC results is a strain contour because DIC looks at strain, it looks at the motion of the points to calculate strain. So we'll give you this code to calculate out a strain contour plot and you'll be able to compare that to your uh, digital image correlation results. So we made it slightly easier by, by giving you a code that, um, plots out what the theoretical surface should look like. Cool. Uh, that is less than ideal. Okay. What questions do you have now? I don't know how well this all came across. Uh, if you have something that's not like infinitely long, um, like let's say that you have like a shorter thing, does that, do you just have, uh, like edge where the stress kind of stops tailing off to zero, um, does that change the analysis significantly? It would change the analysis, and that is something that you'll have to look. At. So, so the in the ex experiments you'll be doing for the DIC lab, it's a hole in a in a plate that's about two inches wide. The hole's a quarter inch, um, and so you don't have a semi-infinite plate, uh, and it does increase the stress concentration factor a bit. Um, because you can imagine, so there are, I don't think there's, I, I think there's numerical solutions to, to that problem. I don't know that there's analytic ones, but you can imagine now if I had a plate with a hole, um, that was a significant volume of the plate. So now say this hole was half the width of the plate instead of very small relative to the plate, the stress here would be a lot higher than the far field stress. So technically at this edge, you still have your stress is your, your far field stress. It's that sigma naught, but then it increases very rapidly um, so that here you would have a stress concentration higher than three. Three is actually the, the not best case scenario, I guess, I guess best case scenario where you have, um, there's, there's no additional stresses coming from that from that boundary condition. Okay. So now I have a couple um, extension problems or extension questions about this that I'm going to have you think about. Um, so first, if I now, so I, I gave you the solution for a whole uh, the, the tens tension around a hole, uh, the sorry, the stress concentration around a hole in tension in a semi-infinite plate. What now are the stress concentrations in a hole around a hole for a semi-infinite plate in compression? So, um, semi-infinite uh, hole compression. So now I still have that same large plate, except I'm now applying a s compressive stress here. What are the stresses around that edge of the hole? <coughs> Think about it for maybe 20 seconds, and then turn and talk to your neighbor when you thought about it. Like the 
go ahead and talk to your neighbors about it for like another 30 seconds to a minute. Obviously, automatically, you think if something's compressing it, it doesn't have anything supporting in the middle, it's going to kind of squish. And so, if a lot of the deformation is happening at the top and bottom, that kind of tells you that that's where a lot of the stress is happening. So, I mean, again, I, I think just intuitively it'd be the reverse of the uh, tension results work. But, but, so that's because that's because I went down. Okay. So, who wants to share what they've been talking about? It's the opposite. So then, what would the max stress be, and where would it be? Yes, what what the you mean the top of the circle or the bottom or the right left? Yeah, top and bottom. Okay. So you would get the the max stresses there, what would the magnitude of those be? Yep. So you would still have a negative three sigma naught. What about on these edges then? So you would get exactly that. So this the solution that we came up with is um, all assuming also small strain elastic deformation, because that is kind of the the mo for all of the problems we're solving here. Um, so then to figure out what the stress distribution is, we can just plug in a negative sigma one minus uh, two cosine of two theta and say that now the stress di distribution around the circle, um, instead of just having a positive sigma naught, I have a negative sigma naught. So my, I guess the absolute max is three, but the it's a negative three, com so compressive stress here and a tensile stress there. Oh. Now, uh, this one I just set up a pole everywhere for. Um, now, what happens if we have a hole in biaxial tension? So. Um, if I have now a, a semi-infinite plate that I'm pulling on in both directions with some stress sigma naught, and I still have that hole, what is the maximum stress around the edges of that plate? Take 30 seconds and talk about it to, with your neighbors. I just assume like a superposition of the two states would probably be a good way to represent it. wants to share what they've been talking about. So it looks like most people have chosen C. Why? Um, because if it's biaxial, there'll be like a 90 degree switch between the two, and you can just add 
Yeah. Yep, exactly. So yeah, I heard superposition bouncing around. That is this idea that at least in in the linear elastic regime, if I have multiple stress states being imposed on a body, I can say that this is the same thing as um, adding those two stresses. So adding the stress going in this way around the hole and the stress in this way around the hole. So what that looks like uh, solution wise is I have my sigma theta is um, then sigma naught one minus two cosine of two theta plus my sigma naught one minus two cosine of now two theta plus pi over two, which um, this, uh, if you remember trig identities much, uh, you know that cosine of theta plus pi is then just negative cosine. So these two actually cancel each other out. And not only do you get, so, so now you can say the maximum at these points is three sigma naught minus sigma naught. This one is minus sigma naught plus three sigma naught. So then it's just a, kind of as a quick check, it's a, a max stress of two here at the edges. If we actually plug in all these values, we get that the total stress around all of the edges, this cosine of two theta and this cosine of two theta plus pi over two cancel out. And I actually just end up with a two sigma naught around the entire edge of that circle. So I'm actually helping myself out by adding a bias and reducing some of that stress concentration. Um, cool, 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 cool. So uh, one real quick thing, then I'll go through a couple slides on DIC and we'll talk about DIC more tomorrow. So um, now what happens if I don't, so, so all these solutions I, I came up with for a circular hole in a semi-infinite plate. What happens if I now don't have um, if I don't have just a circular hole? There we go. So what I want to know the solution for is now an elliptical hole uh, in a semi-infinite plate, still subjected to that far field stress. Still some far field stress. And I'm going to call this uh, 2a and 2b with 2a height, or sorry, uh, major, semi-major axis a, semi-minor axis b, uh, and I still have some sigma naught being applied. The stress here in this body now, I can, I can find out an analytic solution uh, using a similar method to the one before, but the math ends up being way more difficult because I have to use elliptical coordinates instead of cylindrical polar coordinates, which are a whole, that's a whole thing. Um, but I can say eventually that the maximum stress <coughs> occurs here along this top edge of the sample, and the magnitude of it is sigma naught times one plus two A over B. So now, as that aspect ratio of the ellipse gets sharper, so as uh, A becomes much larger than B, then my sigma max would trend toward infinity, um, which is problematic. So for lots of materials, we do have very sharp cracks in them. And so uh, if I had like a hairline crack in a material, this means that tech theoretically it would have, an, from this analysis, it would have an infinite stress um, at that root of the crack, and any minor perturbation would just cause it to split in half, which is not ideal. But in most materials, that's not necessarily the case. So this is the, uh, the cornerstone, I guess, of, of lots of fracture mechanics analysis, is how does that stress concentration work? How do we think about stress concentrations? How do we analyze fracture or energy dissipation around those stress concentrations in fracture processes. Um, and so we'll talk about that more 
uh, probably tomorrow, definitely by Wednesday. So, uh, real quick now, we have about seven minutes left. I am going to talk about digital image correlation. So, here we go. So, uh, digital image correlation is a digital technique that tracks a, pat a speckle pattern on a sample. So you may have seen something like this before. This is an example of a hole in the plate now with a semi-random speckle pattern across the sample. Um, and it tracks basically the deformation, like the relative motion of small subsets of these across the body to figure out what the strain in the body is. And I'll, I'll go through this in a little bit more detail tomorrow. But this is an example of a good quality speckle pattern on a, on a circular hole. This technique can be used at the micro scale or at the macro scale. So it's, it's scale independent, it's rate independent, so it doesn't matter what size your sample is, it doesn't matter how fast your thing is going, all that matters is that you capture a series of image to track, images to track how those pixels are moving. So here, this is a, an image of fluorescent silica nanoparticles on a chip. So uh, you can see the 40 micron scale bar there, which um, a piece of paper is about 100 microns thick. So um, nanoparticles, teeny tiny stuff. Uh, and so they figured out a way, this, this group figured out a way to, to make these silica nanoparticles fluoresce and then they could track the deformation of surfaces at the nanoscale. Um, this is a more practical example of a DIC pattern on a wind turbine blade. So um, you can see these are now fairly large speckle patterns, but uh, it's relative to the size of the part, they're small. Uh, and then you track the motion of those points to figure out what the stresses in, in these parts are. And it doesn't matter necessarily how fast this thing is spinning or how fast things are moving. All that matters is that you're able to take images of these points as they slowly move around uh, in space. So here now is an example of a DIC tension test. So this is, let's see if it wants to go, maybe, there we go, cool. So in your tension test, no, doesn't want to maximize, cool. In your tension test, you eventually have necking in the part. So you have some uniform stress distribution initially before it really quickly fails. Let's, let's play that again. So there's a nice uniform stress distribution in this thing before eventually you can see the, the initiation of necking in the middle there, and then that's where failure starts to happen. So this is in that, that idea of true strain. It's difficult to measure what the true strain is in a material without putting teeny tiny strain gauges everywhere. What you're effectively doing with DIC is putting teeny tiny strain gauges everywhere. Um, this is an example now maybe, there we go, of a DIC around a cracked plate. So this is the sort of fracture type analysis we'll be looking at, um, is what the stress concentrations around these plates, around these, these sharp corners in plates are. And you can see this, there's this kind of stereotypical uh, butterfly wing pattern that emanates around the tip of a crack. Um, and you can see stresses start to build until eventually it'll crack somewhere. There we go, and eventually it fails. Um, so this is the type of analysis you'll be doing in your DIC lab this week, um, except with a circular hole in a plate. Um, this, so my, my experience with DIC, this is now a test that I had done on a 3D woven carbon fiber composite, which, let's see if it wants to play. No? doesn't want to play? Maybe not. Cool. Let's get out of there. Let's bring this over. There we go. So this is something that I had done for research uh, a while ago, but you can see um, kind of very localized regions of stresses in a material that's being deformed very significantly eventually you start to lose the sample when it gets close to breaking. So you'll notice that it can't, it has to be able to track the motion of points well, and if it can't, uh, if the deformation is too severe, it can't necessarily track 
all of those points and keep uh, keep sure where they all are. So here, there's a white patch where you start losing the sample uh, before it eventually breaks um, in tension, tensile rupture. Um, so anyway, DIC itself is a very interesting and powerful technique uh, that's kind of used pretty widely in industry now. I think it's an important one to learn. There's a lot of advantages to it, and there's a lot of disadvantages to it. And in the process of the lab, you'll hopefully see, or you will definitely see the disadvantages. Hopefully you'll see the advantages um, along the way. So um, questions or thoughts on that? Otherwise, we'll be, I'll talk more about the theory behind it next week, uh, tomorrow. All right. Thanks, everyone.